The following is a production of KPCA, a Minnesota original. Funding for portraits is provided in part by the Dayton Hudson Foundation on behalf of Dayton's and Target stores. Though he used to fantasize about being an astronaut, he turned his attention to weather when he was 13. He's trying to learn how to play golf, and he loves to shop for antiques. He's a very busy man who has perfected the art of the 10-minute catnap. Our guest is Paul Douglas. Paul Douglas, are you the original weather nerd? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was a weather nerd in high school. Uh, I did computer programs in the seventh grade to try to predict the weather. All of them failed miserably. And uh, I remember uh, my name in German class uh, in six, sixth grade was Gustav, and they used to always ask me about the weather in sixth grade. It was a pretty good scam, you know, talking about the weather. You were always interested in it from day one? From about the sixth grade on, I had a really good science teacher, who to this day I credit with, with uh, being responsible for the spark of curiosity. And he fanned that. and. Uh, from that day on, I thought, you know, this is an area that I could be very, very interested in. And uh, I was a Boy Scout, an Eagle Scout, and Weather Merit Badge was a favorite. A number of things sort of converged at the age of about 12, 13. I used to give uh, truckers weather reports on the CB radio every evening at 6 o'clock. We'd gather on Channel 7 and babble about the weather for about 20 minutes. What was your name on the CB? Yeah, the weatherman. <laughs> Not very creative, but... <laughs> the best we could come up with at the time. But, uh, and your parents encouraged you in this? Yeah, they did. They did. In fact, my father still, God love him, sends clippings, weather-related clippings from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and anything at all that, that's sort of interesting. We have an ongoing clipping service. And uh, yeah, I, I really owe a lot to my parents uh, for a lot of reasons, but uh, they really did help me uh, get into weather very, very easily. What other things do you owe to your parents? I think a sense of optimism, especially my, my father uh, has a good sense of humor and uh, an overriding, at times, naive, perhaps, sense of optimism. And I think you have to have that, first of all, to be working in, in, uh, in television news. Why? Because it's, it's a business of cynics. I mean, Basically, you're supposed to be cynical. Um, you're supposed to uh, question truth. And uh, I think that sense of optimism in some regards runs contrary to what is expected in the television news business. It's also a very unstable business. I mean, the old adage used to be, have blow dryer, we'll travel. You know, keep the U-Haul warmed up, the next job is uh, just a phone call away. That has changed in the past five to ten years, mercifully. Uh, more people are staying put. But it used to be every two, three years, you were expected to, to go to the next city. Otherwise, something was wrong with you. You're damaged goods. Why aren't you moving on? Do you feel that pressure? Not so much. Not, not here in the Twin Cities. This has always been a very stable market. And uh, you look at people like Dave Moore and Bud Crailing, uh, who are institutions here. Uh, the Twin Cities, more than just about any other metro area, in the country demands stability. People here want to turn on the TV tube and know that they're going to see a certain face. And uh, somewhere along the way, news directors wised up and they realized, hey, if we keep the same people on the air and promote them and give them a chance, maybe viewers will come around and maybe they'll be successful. But uh, I can't imagine a more interesting place to do the weather. There are some other cities in the country where weather is taken seriously where there is weather to talk about, I don't think any more interesting than the Twin Cities. This is it. This is the Super Bowl of weather. And I've said that ad nauseum, but it really is true. Uh, Boston, a serious weather town. Chicago, fairly serious. Kansas City, Oklahoma City. But in terms of having that overall balance, uh, where the public is interested, where the public is knowledgeable. I mean, if, if you go on the air in Los Angeles and talk about dew point, you'll be, you'll be run out of town who cares about dew point? Is there a dew point in LA? What is it anyway? Is there wind chill in Phoenix? Probably not. Um, you know, 50 days out of the year here in the Twin Cities, the weather is potentially life-threatening. 
some sort of a watch or warning, uh, something that could put a crimp in your day. And so in terms of the technology that meteorologists are given, the time that we're given, and the assumption, the fact that you can assume that the viewer at home has a certain modicum of intelligence when it comes to weather, all those things make this area a very special place if you're a meteorologist. What do you think about the symbolism that's on weather maps? It's very militaristic, don't you think, with the with arrows the and the fronts and the movement? Well, you know, we, we owe this to a Norwegian by the name of Bjerknes, who actually uh, decided that the weather map looked like the battleground of World War I with the fronts. And the, and the whole term front really originates from World War I. Uh, fronts are really the dividing lines of, of air masses. That's where the, the atmospheric battles take place. And uh, so long about 1920, a Norwegian decided, you know what, this really does resemble what's happening on the battlefields of, of Europe. So is and that so, part of the appeal for you? Well, not really. Not really. Uh, although I think any meteorologist... Uh, worth his or her salt will tell you that on a sunny, bright day with nothing happening, it's, it's fairly boring. I think um, our hearts beat fastest when the weather is wild, when the weather is severe. That's when, we're, that's when we feel most needed. Are you all in touch with one another? I mean, do you talk to meteorologist buddies on the phone? Uh, Dave Dahl and, and, uh, and Mike Fairborn and... Uh, Joe Dandry over at Channel 9 are all friends. Uh, I wouldn't say that we're close. It's, it's a, uh, a fairly competitive business. Uh, I'm close with other uh, weather buddies in other markets in other cities around the country. And the uh, great thing about living in the Twin Cities is anytime anybody tells you a story about the weather, you can always one-up them. Well, you think that's something. Well, let me tell you about this. It was so cold today, and my lips froze together. Uh, you can always top somebody else's weather tale. So what else are you up to besides forecasting the weather on the television? It's not the only thing you do, is it? For me, the joy is, uh, is taking the weather, which is essentially storytelling. And people say, well, what, you know, what are you doing every night? And I think what I'm trying to do is, uh, is tell a story a story about the weather, a story which has a logical beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning is what has happened, the middle is what is happening now, and the end of that story is what will happen, what do we think will happen. And uh, it's been an interesting evolution over the years. I mean, we went from the weather professor, the professorial uh, person standing up there for 10 minutes with a piece of chalk and talking about, mumbling about things that frankly people really don't care about lecturing people about the weather. And then we went to the weather bunny in the, uh, the 1970s. Uh, they hired, in many cases, women who had no concept of, of what was happening weather-wise. And the weather bunny, it sounds sexist, and it, and it was. It was very sexist. And thankfully, we're, we've moved away from that. And in many weather-sensitive markets now, meteorologists are being hired who have some formal schooling. Do you? Yes, I went to Penn State, although there's a big caveat there. Uh, just about the time you think you have it all figured out, Mother Nature gives you a swift kick in the rump. Uh, weather, is, weather forecasting is still every bit an art as it is a science. It is not a clean science like mathematics. It's a dirty science. And for that reason, a lot of meteorologists never get into forecasting. They stay in the theoretical end, dreaming up these math equations that describe how the atmosphere works. But um, it's not a simple thing. I mean, predicting the future is difficult. Ask any economist. Somebody once said, what, if the economist predicted the weather and the meteorologist predicted the economy, we'd be in, in, in a much better situation here in this country. It's hard predicting the future. It really is. There are billions of factors which will influence what the weather will be tomorrow over North America, any handful of which may be critical. Computers have helped us since the 1960s, but the computers are only as good as our knowledge, our understanding of the weather, which is very incomplete. How the oceans influence the weather, how mountains influence the weather, all of these things are represented in our computer models, but 
in many respects, we're still grasping at straws. We don't really know how the weather machine works. We have three or four computer models that we look at on any given day. Sometimes they all disagree. The nested grid will say rain for tomorrow. The LFM will say snow. The Barrick Clinic will say partly sunny. What do you predict? That's where gut feeling and a good memory, being able to say, well, I remember, I remember a similar situation three years ago. Here's what happened. It's not cut and dry. Rarely is the forecast black or white. Usually it's some nebulous shade of gray. And you have to go in there and say, OK, do I believe the computers? Do I believe my gut feeling? What do I think will happen? You're also involved in designing software, computer software, for weather prediction, right? Right. For the past 10, 11 years, we've had a computer graphics explosion in terms of trying to tell that weather story. All those fancy maps that we point to on our chroma keyboards. But in all cases, in all cases we are looking at a two-dimensional map. We're looking straight down on the weather. And it really has enabled us to do a lot more than just magnetic maps or using magic markers. We can now convey a lot more information in a three or four minute weather cast. Uh, I have a company on the side. In fact, we are uh, in the process now of soliciting investors who share the same vision, the whole concept of 3D weather. Instead of just looking down on the weather, being able to actually fly into the weather with terrain below and the skyline of St. Paul and Minneapolis and real-time weather above. And we now have the computer firepower to be able to do that with some of these upper-end workstations. In this case, we're working on silicon graphics workstations. Some mathematical processes that would have required supercomputer capability just five years ago, you can now do on a workstation costing $20,000. You can do some amazing things. And so we're trying to bring these applications into television news and television weather. And the whole concept of flying into a scene, um, sort of a magic carpet ride, if you will, across a metropolitan area showing real-time weather, that's what's getting me excited right now. You also have a company that predicts the weather as a service right. for institutions and businesses that depend on it. Right. The, uh, the company is Total Weather, and we're based in YZ. Growing up out east in Pennsylvania, there are literally scores of private weather services that try to go in and fine-tune the forecast for specific users, radio, construction, what have you. And I came to the Twin Cities in 1983, and I was amazed that there really are no services that are trying to perfect the weather forecast. Now, the National Weather Service does a great job. And I'm not going to sit here and badmouth their product. They do a fantastic job. Their forecast covers tens of thousands of square miles. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the time to go in and tailor a forecast for a specific user. Um, some of our clients, like the Mall of America, if it rains on freshly poured concrete, they can be out twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in less than two minutes. And so to have a weather insurance policy, to be able to pick up the phone and talk to a meteorologist and say, OK, uh, my butt is hanging over the precipice. Tell me, is it going to rain over the next two hours? I need to know. Uh, there's a lot we can do now. And what we try to do at Total Weather is phone and fax weather information to a, a diverse group of uh, weather-sensitive clients. Uh, 394, MnDOT project, obviously very weather-sensitive. We have very small roofers, roofing contractors. Uh, golf courses around the Twin Cities metro area, all it takes is one lightning strike to, uh, to ruin their day. Weather is a big deal in the Twin Cities. I'm not sure you would need a service like this in Phoenix or San Diego or Honolulu, but in the Twin Cities where the weather is so wild, I tell people, and they look at me like I'm crazy, and perhaps I am, but you would have to travel to parts of Siberia or Mongolia to find greater swings of the weather pendulum, greater extremes in weather than we have right here in Minnesota. Generally, as you get away from the oceans and towards the center of continents, the weather gets more extreme, more severe. You have more record highs, record lows, more drought, uh, more severe thunderstorms, and that certainly is the case right here at home. So there is a need for this kind of product, and we're trying to provide it. So we have 
the forecasting on television, we have the forecasting early morning on the radio, we have total weather as a business, we have the work on the computer software, and you have a family? I have a family. I have a family. Yes, I have a family. Um, balancing family and profession. I, everybody, everybody has that problem. Uh, the problem with television especially... It sounds like you really have it. Well, it is, and, and I've become increasingly protective of, uh, of weekends. If you let it, television news will take every spare moment of your day. Uh, you could have two, three, four speaking engagements every single day. I jokingly say that I'm on the fourth grade lecture circuit. I think I do know just about every fourth grader on a first name basis in the Twin Cities. It's important to get out and talk to kids, and I try to do one or two talks a week. I think it's really important to get out. Again, one good teacher in, in seventh grade made a huge difference in my life, igniting my interest in weather. So I think it's important to get out and encourage kids to try to make their hobbies professions. And, that, and that's basically nine out of ten days, my profession is my hobby. There are some days where it's a job. Uh, when is a job? When, the, when, when a tornado watch is in effect or a blizzard watch. Um, when the weather is severe and you're running back and forth and you're trying to get warnings on the air and you're trying to juggle radio stations and the Star Tribune and Channel 11. Oh, I forgot that. You have a column in the Star Tribune. Yeah. Again, the fun for me is, is packaging weather for different mediums. Let's go back to the family. The, uh, the juggling of, of private life and professional life it's, it's an ongoing dilemma, but... Uh, you have two children? I have two boys. Their ages? Walt is three and a half, going on 17. Uh, Brett just turned one, and... Um, when do you see them? I see them in the morning. Thankfully, the radio that I do in the morning with KDWB, I, I can do that from home. I have a broadcast quality phone line, so I can literally roll out of bed, uh, take a peek at channel 17, to make sure the forecast isn't busting from last night and go on the air live and then I can have breakfast with the family and spend a few hours at home in the morning. If there's no severe weather in the evening, I can sneak home for dinner after 6.30, after the 6 o'clock newscast. Uh, it's a little dependent on what the weather is doing. But, um, and weekends. Weekends are sacrosanct. Um, there are so many worthy charitable events and so many people who'd like you to come out and talk to their organizations on weekends, and I've just, I've just been forced to say no, and I'm sorry, family comes first. And thankfully, most Minnesotans can appreciate that and understand that, that weekends are really devoted to family, and I, and I just can't, I can't make an exception. What kind of father are you? a good question. Family comes first, and I say that, and at times I wonder if I believe it. I, uh, I fantasize about an eight-to-five job. I fantasize about having evenings free. I fantasize about being able to tuck my kids in bed every night. Some nights I can do that, some nights I can't. It's a, uh, it's a strange way to make a living. So I, I can't sit here and complain. I'm, I'm doing what I love. I'm doing what I enjoy. Um, Channel 11 has given me the latitude to start some of these other businesses. A lot of television stations would not. They would clamp down and say, you know what? You are ours, lock, stock, and barrel. These other outside ventures, knock it off. Gannett uh, has given me the latitude. And there's been, a, I think, a synergistic effect with the Star Tribune and the radio stations and, and what have you. I think it has benefited. I hope it has benefited CARE 11. I don't want it to be at the expense of family. Um, but I would be dishonest if I said that I don't worry about that. You know, am I spending enough time with my kids? I think I am. I think you can always spend more time with your kids. And it's something that I wrestle with every day. It does bother me. And the but fantasy is to have an eight to five job. And I don't know, in this business, I don't know if that'll ever happen. But Tell me about your wife. 
Lori, Lori married me in spite of the fact that, uh, that I've been broadcasting. We uh, were college sweethearts. How'd you meet? We met at Penn State after a Doobie Brothers concert. And uh, we went to a party. Neither of us wanted to be at that party. She wasn't having a good time. I wasn't having a good time. And as soon as I saw her, I knew that uh, I had to get to know her. And this is probably the worst come online in the history of man, but I went up to her and I said, you know, did anybody ever tell you you look like Barbara Streisand? <laughs> she thought I was talking about her nose and I was talking about her big, beautiful eyes. So she didn't know whether to thank me or hit me. What'd she say? She blushed and she said, no, you're the first. And uh, it was a bad come online, but uh, it worked. And by the end of the evening, I got her phone number. She's an architect. And uh, the fact that she's not in broadcasting, I think, has helped our relationship. I think uh, I've seen some cases where it's worked. But I think in a lot of cases, uh, there can be competition or the hours can just be very, very debilita debilitating to a, uh, to a relationship. But she's a good architect. She's worked for a couple of firms in the Twin Cities, Hamill Green in Minneapolis, and she worked for Waters and Bonner uh, doing residential homes uh, west of Minneapolis. She's now taking off a couple of years to, uh, to raise our kids, but she's, uh, she's anxious to get back into it. She designed the house that we're living in, and uh, she's good. She's, she's a perfectionist, and I think some of that has rubbed off on me. She's never quite satisfied with her work. Got any fantasies that have nothing to do with weather, but have to do with something in your life, something ethical or social or completely fantastical? I'd like to buy a big Winnebago and just travel North America and document the weather, enjoy the weather. Uh, my other real fantasy is to write, and I think everybody, a lot of people have that fantasy, and a lot of people think they can write. I'm not sure I can write. But I'm going to give it a try. Fiction? Fiction. Got a couple of ideas and... Uh... Oh, tell one. <laughs> well, now, if I tell the idea... It'll help you. It'll help me. <laughs> it'll help me. Uh... I have to be careful. I have an idea about a mythical television newsroom set in the future, which... Uh, where the news director goes kind of out of control. And it, it has no semblance, no bearing on reality. But it's sort of a worst-case scenario what might local television news become in the 21st century? And I have a few ideas for that. Who's the protagonist, the main character? Well, the anchorman, of course, would be the hero. And uh, the news director, uh, in the name of ratings, is willing to do just about anything. Are there any fiction ideas you have that are completely unrelated to TV and weather? I think I, I have a few ideas about uh, about science and and weighing science versus faith and a lot of people have trouble with faith because it falls outside of the realm of of science and the scientific method people say well well your belief structure is based on blind faith and i say no it's not it's based on a certain degree of evidence and a high degree of probability you know i can't guarantee you that abraham lincoln lived in the mid-1800s, but there's enough evidence, circumstantial and otherwise, for me to say, yeah, you know, I, I think, I do believe that Abraham Lincoln existed, and, and I do believe that uh, he had a lot to contribute. So I have a few other ideas for the, the whole struggle, if you will, between science and faith, science and religion. Often they seem at odds. They don't necessarily have to be. Paul Douglas, thank you for being with us on Portrait. Thank you.
Funding for Portrait is provided in part by the Dayton Hudson Foundation on behalf of Dayton and Target Stores. This program was produced by KTCA, a Minnesota original. Major funding for Sunday night's broadcast schedule is provided by Liberty State Bank, the Family Bank of St. Paul, member FDIC. Additional funding is provided by Lakewood Cemetery, serving the Twin Cities for more than 100 years, celebrating life. Donaldson Company, worldwide manufacturer of filtration products for heavy-duty diesel engines and industrial applications, and by the members of Channel 2. Members to Port San Antonio.